Hello and welcome again to UCL Global Health. Since the 1980s, we've seen this huge pandemic of an emerging virus, HIV, which has caused massive uh, fatality and chaos in many countries of the world. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, Professor Robin Weiss, who's one of our most distinguished uh, HIV scientists. And we're going to talk about the threat of uh, HIV and other emerging viruses. But Robin, uh, can I go back 30 years? Let's go back to exactly 30 years, 1983. You were director of the Institute for Cancer Research, yes. working on viruses in causing cancer. Yes. And suddenly you hear about an epidemic in Uganda, which was called slim disease. That's right. Do you want to take up the story of how you got involved then with HIV? Well, in, in the same year, in May 2003, uh, Françoise Barry-Sunussi and her colleagues in Paris uh, first isolated what we now call HIV. And this was one of several candidates. Before Robert Gallo? And... Yes, one yeah. year before Bob Gallo, mm. who also did splendid work in the States. But the French were a year ahead. Yeah. And that's why she won the Nobel Prize. Right. Um, so we started working on this virus. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember the exact date it, because it was um, a leap year day, 29th of February. Um, Rachnir Cheongsong in my lab came back from Paris with this virus. And uh, for some reason, we got it growing. We had green fingers and got it growing in large amounts in the lab. We didn't have good containment in those days. But by being able to grab it, we're, we were able to uh, devise a blood test with Richard Tedder, right. professor of clinical virology at the Middlesex, now part of UCL, um, that really worked. So with, within a year, um, we had a means for testing blood donations. And, and you were using this to obviously screen for blood donations in the UK, but you tested the Ugandans. Yes. And you were rather shocked, I believe, when you found, when you looked at the control specimens. Yes. We worked with Nelson Siwankambo and David Sawada in uh, the Mulago Hospital, Kampala. They had this new disease that people were dying from that they called slim disease because the outward symptoms where you lost weight, uh, became too slim and died. Um, and uh, uh, we tested uh, serum from these patients. They were all positive. Um, the control, healthy controls, more or less age-matched, were hospital staff, and they were 10% positive. And we thought, uh-uh, um, our test is not as accurate uh, in Africa as we'd found it to be in the UK. We're getting false positives. And then the penny dropped that these were not false positives, that 10% of the working population in Kampala. So before any of the modelers got to grip, you must have been aware oh, of yes. the size of the problem. What well, mo modelers need data to model on. Otherwise, it's garbage in and garbage out. Yeah. So th they are st there is still a role for lab science of actually getting <laughs> a few results uh, <laughs> yes. uh, and handing it over to the modelers. Yes. So you were suddenly faced with this huge problem. You then went on and worked with Peter Beverly and Gus Dalgleish, and you discovered the CD4 antigen on the T lymphocyte, which was the mechanism by which HIV bound yes. and caused the problem. Yes. So you got the diagnostic test, yes. you found the kind of key well, if, mechanism. If we go back two years earlier, the, the first full clinical description of uh, AIDS in American patients was published by Michael Gottlieb in 1981, in December, in New England Journal of Medicine. And he already pinpointed then that there was a selective loss of CD4 positive T helper lymphocytes, that the other kinds of lymphocytes were fine, but these had disappeared from AIDS patients. So we already knew that this was a disease that was picking out CD4 cells. Right. And then David Klatzman in Paris showed that uh, if he separated CD4 lymphocytes from other kinds of lymphocytes in culture, this newly isolated HIV would only propagate in the CD4 cells. Right. And we went on to show that the very marker that was used by immunologists to uh, uh, label kinds of cells 
was uh, the cell surface molecule that the virus was using. Oh, right. so, and that was with yeah. Peter Beverly, who was then at UCL. So, uh, but I remember, this was 85, 86. That was 84. We published in December 84, alongside a paper from David Klutzman. So right. he also got onto the same thing. So people at that stage were saying, well, look, we've, we've found the virus. We've got a test. We know the mechanism. The next stage must be a vaccine. And I remember reading the medical journals and the newspapers in the mid 80s, people were saying, people like you, I think, but maybe not you, saying, look, we'll have a vaccine, but it'll take about five years. That's right. There was great hope that there would be uh, a vaccine and one could be developed early. There have been so many successful vaccines against virus infections, yellow fever, polio, influenza, and so on. Um, but there have also been difficulties in making vaccines against other infectious agents. Mm. Uh, we've had a yellow fever vaccine for 70 years, but it's relative dengue. We don't have a vaccine yet. Right. So why? What, what's the problem? And what's the problem with HIV? Because we're not going to get a vaccine, are we? I think we will, yes. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't put a time on it, and I didn't then. We published a paper in 1985, so it's going back to those days. Yeah where we looked at um, whether uh, antibodies from people who were infected with HIV still well would neutralize the virus. Would these um, antibodies prevent the virus getting into cells, which is a, a mark of humoral immunity, antibody immunity mm. to, to viruses. And uh, we found that although there were very high teeters of antibodies against the outer envelope antigens on the virus, mm. which should be the targets for neutralization, the actual functional neutralization was extraordinarily weak. So I was one of those people who was already saying, uh-uh, there's a problem here. Mm. If, um, if people who are infected and are keeping well can't make good antibodies, um, can we just take a, 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 a killed virus, make a killed vaccine, like the Salk vaccine? Could we make a live attenuated virus, like the Sabin vaccine upon your... Well, how do you tell whether an HIV virus is attenuated? Yeah. Uh, if it takes nine, ten years to cause AIDS when it's uh, 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 the oh, real thing, can you wait around and see if it's attenuated? So we knew there was a problem. Then we, we learned that the virus is, um, it covers itself uh, with a lot of carbohydrates that cause a sort of fuzz that don't let antibodies in. Now we know there are some good antibodies that tackle the carbohydrates, but that hasn't given us a vaccine yet. And there's another problem. If you look at the variability of the virus, mm -hmm. it's like having a thousand influenza strains out there all at the same time. This virus is more variable than anything else I know, with the possible exception of hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. and we don't have a vaccine for hep C yet either. So there were hopes for a vaccine, but um, they were ill-founded. I always say that prevention is better than cure, but actually therapies based on knowledge of the virus, mm. antiretroviral therapies came in first. So you haven't given up hope of a vaccine. No. I just want to finish by asking you about new threats. You know, every year in the newspapers and we read about, we have the SARS virus, influenza threats. Now we've just had a coronavirus, which is highly... Uh, damage it well the case fatality rates are very high but yeah. fortunately it seems transmission is relatively low um, I mean do you see another pandemic emerging in the next couple of decades uh, what's your thoughts about this for global health yes I do see uh, new pandemics emerging but we've got off lightly in the last couple of decades so uh, SARS is also a coronavirus. So are some of the common cold viruses. So not all coronaviruses are both deadly and very rapidly spreading. Uh, SARS did spread rapidly thanks to uh, airlines. Mm. They came out of southern China into Hong Kong, and within a week it was in Toronto and in London and in Frankfurt. Um, but it wasn't highly transmissible in the sense that Ebola virus in Africa isn't. The main people who were getting infected were the carers, nurses and loved ones mm. of people so seriously sick. And uh, although the WHO claims that they are modelling zapped the virus, 
the virus sapped itself. It's not that good at getting around. Mm. Uh, there's one little difference between SARS and um, influenza that uh, you don't, if, if you're infected with SARS and probably other coronaviruses like this new one, you don't spread it until you feel terribly sick. Right. Whereas with flu, you can spread it for two days before you feel that sick. And therefore, the virus has a chance to get out of the... But is there a serious risk, like the Hollywood film, of a uh, new yeah. virus that is highly lethal yes. and also rapidly and also, spread? Yes. yes, and we were very lucky with the, the 2009 H1N1 flu that it wasn't highly lethal. It killed several thousand people, but most people didn't have any symptoms at all. Uh, so there is a risk. Um, uh, uh, contagion, that Hollywood film, was pretty good. We had a special showing of it with experts at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical mm. Medicine, just before it was released. Um, what the, the most fictional part of it, I mean, the whole thing was fiction, was um, uh, this hero who made a vaccine within four months. Um, it takes longer than that. So actually, things if we are unlucky it's going to be bad news. So yeah. your message to students must be virology, microbiology, immunology is still an incredibly important and exciting subject and we need people to be taking this seriously. Infectious diseases have not gone away. Um, vaccines, through understanding how these infectious agents replicate, um, so studying viruses, studying parasites like malaria, studying bacteria like TB, terribly important. And there will be others in the future. Robin, thank you very much.